There is a legal need to make your training accessible, but there is also a human side. When we talk about whether or not we want to tackle accessibility projects, what you're really asking is, are you comfortable denying someone a basic human right? And in that context, the answer is pretty clear. You, you don't. Our guest, Sean Wonder, is a learning architect with a passion for accessibility. Accessible learning may sound challenging, but it's a lot easier to get started than you may think. Listen to Sean to hear five steps you can take to make learning accessible. I'm Susan Court. Powered by Learning is next. Powered by Learning is brought to you by DaVinci Interactive. DaVinci's approach to learning is grounded in 30 years of innovation and expertise. We use proven strategies and leading technology to develop solutions that empower learners to improve quality and boost performance. Learn more at DaVinci.com. Well, today I am joined by Angeline Evans, our client solutions consultant at DaVinci. Hi, Angeline. Hi, Susan. I'm so excited to talk with Sean Wonder today. Me too. I cannot wait to hear his tips about accessibility. All right. Well, Sean, we're going to get right into it. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having me here on the podcast. Sean, start out by telling us about your background and your expertise in accessibility. Sure. So I'm a learning and development architect. And uh, about 20 years ago, I was in a small town kind of board, um, started <laughs> learning web design on my own, really interested in the accessibility part of it. And that came not from the disability piece, but just from the idea of how do I make this one thing look the same on all these different devices and with all these different connection types? And how do I maximize that? And so that just became an entry point that as I learned more, as I picked up a couple of degrees and worked into learning and development, just I kept carrying on with that and learning more and more and more until I cracked into this accessibility idea and what that means and all of the different things that go into that, including you know the need for accessibility from a disability standpoint. And so it just kind of all naturally evolved. Like I think most learning and development people fall into it. I sort of fell into accessibility the same way. So just kind of crashed into learning and development, crashed into accessibility, and here I am. We're thankful for that. Yeah, you've got some great advice. Um, I'm, we're excited to hear you uh, hear you share everything with people today. Like you mentioned, you got into accessibility uh, organically, let's say. Um, but just to go back to basics for our listeners, you know, why should we? all be considering accessibility in our online learning solutions? So, I mean, there's there's two sides to it. There's the human side, and one in eight people in the United States are diagnosed with a disability. So it's a very human need, but then there's also the law. And the law gets complicated, and I'll try to break it down a little bit. So um, there's Section 508, and Section 508, you, you hear that term, it doesn't necessarily get put into context a lot. So Section 508 refers to Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And that entire law just says if you take any federal funding, you have to have accessible technology. It, it just has to be that way. And that's often where this conversation ends. But that's not where the law ends, right? So we have, we have uh, the American Disabilities Act. We have Title III of that. And that says that state, local government organizations, and any business open to the public has to provide accessible technology. Those laws are great, and they work from that legal perspective. But uh, again, there's that human piece, which is also the United Nations has said, accessibility is a defined basic human right. It's kind of a bit of a hammer, but when we talk about whether or not we want to tackle accessibility projects, what you're really asking is, are you comfortable denying someone a basic human right? And in that context, the answer is, pretty clear. You you don't. I mean, I would assume you don't anyway, but you know, we, we want to provide these things. All of those frameworks and all of those laws, they're all based on these set of guidelines called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That document is very complicated. There are five requirements to that document. First is just conforming to all of the guidelines in that document. The second one is that the whole page of whatever this technology piece is, that whole page has to also conform to all of these guidelines. Then you get further where like the entire series of pages have to conform. And all of that technology has to be 
accessible with assistive technology. So if, for example, you have a shopping cart, that entire page from I want to buy the thing to I'm now going to check my shopping cart and make sure I actually want to buy this thing to I'm paying for the thing. All of that has to fit those guidelines or the entire thing fails accessibility. And then beyond that, if you have a piece of technology on the page, the final requirement is that that technology, if it doesn't meet the accessibility requirements outlined in the guidelines, it doesn't block or restrict access to the whole rest of that page or site. And that's all very complicated. And I've made it sound sort of easy, but there's a lot in those requirements. <laughs> I don't think you made that sound easy at all. It sounds, it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds a little scary. I mean, how do organizations tackle that when that it sounds mm -hmm. kind of, um, you know, challenging? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is, is awareness, right? And so when I say this is geared towards a web page, organizations tend to hear, well, that doesn't apply to, and then there's a list. And that's not really accurate, right? So, so one of the things I heard in a project was, well, that doesn't apply to our learning content. Well, it does, because where does your LMS live? On the web. It loads on a web browser, right? So that makes it a web page. That makes every piece of content in your LMS part of a website. And now it falls under the web content accessibility guidelines. And then also all these other laws that are codified with that web content accessibility guidelines as their back, right? Um, you know, I have a video. It doesn't need closed captioning, right? Well, your video lives on YouTube and YouTube is a website. I know it's an app, but apps are websites. It's just a website. That means your video does need closed captioning. Um, so, you know, you could say the same thing for Vimeo or any of the other service providers. Like, they're all websites. These are all web-based content, and they all fall under this web content accessibility guideline. So we do need to apply this to everything, and we have to be honest about where we apply it. Like, if you have an internal document storage solution, you may not think that's a website, but it's a website only accessible inside your organization this still applies. So these rules, they apply everywhere. Um, you know, getting buy-in, that's sometimes a little bit more difficult because when you talk about learning departments, one of the issues that sometimes you run into is if, if you say, well, this is going to cost X amount of dollars, right? And we can't really justify that because as a learning department, we don't really bring in money. But the view there is that it's not that you're bringing in money, it's that you're saving money. So I'll give you an example. Um, a, a very large retail chain had an ADA Title III lawsuit for their website not being accessible, and their settlement was $6 million. So I, as a learning and development architect, maybe didn't get you $6 million in revenue, but I saved you $6 million in fines. Right. And there's a national pharmacy chain that during the pandemic launched a, a portal for uh, COVID testing and vaccinations, that portal wasn't accessible. And that was a $250,000 settlement. That's significant money. Like these fines aren't like, oh, you know, a couple bucks and we'll forget about it. These are significant fines that have massive impact. And you can alleviate those things by taking this seriously from the start. And so that's where all of these processes that we'll probably talk about in a few minutes come in where how do we make sure we're not having these fines? How do we make sure we're not in breach of these things? And you have to be aware of them because in 2021, there were 2,500 ADA Title III lawsuits. That's a 40% increase over the year prior. This isn't something we can afford as businesses, as service providers, as agencies to ignore. Th that time is gone. We have to deal with these things now and we have to deal with them practically and efficiently. So we're, we're sort of at a place where we have to address all of these needs. Absolutely. And, and, you know, of course, it's so important to be inclusive. And especially, mm -hmm. you know, as learning and development professionals, every single learner matters, right? We're always trying to reach our audience specifically. But what, what would you say to organizations who might have physical requirements of their employees that may say, well, my employees wouldn't need accessible learning. Why would that matter to me for my internal audience? You know, because based on the needs of the job, they have to meet X, Y, and Z. Because I think they still right. do need accessible content. So um, what would you say to them? So there's two sides to this. The, the first is that replace, I don't have, and then a, a person 
who is blind, a person who is deaf. Replace that with an ethnicity. Replace that with a gender and tell me how that sentence sounds. Mm -hmm. Does it sound good? Mm -mm. Probably not, right? (laughs) So we talk about that human need. You still have that human need. From a legal standpoint, it doesn't matter if the job says this doesn't mean anything. There are other people in your organization who might need that training. And uh, whether or not a person can meet a physical requirement, the law still applies. So someone could still try to enter your organization. Your onboarding or your pre-boarding may not be accessible, and you still might get an ADA Title III lawsuit, whether or not someone could physically do the job. Now, that's sort of a worst-case scenario, but the law still applies to you there. Um, beyond that, we talk about you know diversity being a good thing. There's a positive to that. So increasing your training to meet these requirements also just increases the type of workforce that you can bring in. And that diversity is a good thing, right? Think about someone who has had to use a screen reader for their entire life. That's all they know. Their view of content is very different. And their view of efficiency is very different than what ours might be, because our experiences are different. The way we handle technology maybe doesn't fit the same. But that perspective is wildly important to an organization to say, well, maybe there's a gap here that we're not see or maybe there's something we're taking for granted that someone with this other experience could come in and discover all these other things that could you know again save us money make us more money make the team better increase productivity whatever that is there are all these benefits that yeah maybe you do have a physical requirement that says this one specific group can't do this thing but that doesn't mean other groups can't and so you still need those accessibility pieces and you still need to create that culture in your organization that says anyone can work here because one that's just correct as humans Mm -hmm. and two it's still the law sean you mentioned something a couple of minutes ago that is so important and that is to think about accessibility from the start and i know Mm -hmm. angeline will agree in talking to our clients at da vinci we want people to understand the importance of not making accessibility an afterthought talk a little bit about why it's important to consider accessibility before you embark on any learning project, any website. Yeah, so when when you think about accessibility, um, it's not a project. Accessibility is a a process, and your organization should be engaged in that process, and it's it's a long, slow process. And we've sort of teased about this idea of, like, there are these steps that you can start to take, and, you know, we'll get to that in a few minutes, obviously, but when you talk about those steps, like that's the tip of a, of a very large iceberg that would destroy multiple Titanics, right? Like it, there's so much to it, but you have to start somewhere. And so these processes, if you take them on now and you're developing new content, let's assume that your organization, as you create learning, uses the Addy model, right? The E in Addy is evaluation. And that tends to say at some point, you should go back and evaluate whether this content worked. Did the learning work? Did the learner get what they wanted to? Did we as an organization get what we wanted to out of this learning in terms of reshaping our our staff? Like, is it meeting even the requirements that we now have a year later, two years later, whatever that is? And when we do that evaluation period, one of the things we can do is just reshape all of that content. The work's already done, right? Let's Let's assume that the content hasn't changed. If we just have an accessible framework that we can essentially copy paste that content into and build accessibly from the start, you can get that content with low effort, low lift, meeting accessibility requirements. And then when you start new projects, if you're building from there, you're not wasting resources going back because you've gotten sued or you've had some sort of other issue. You're not wasting those resources saying, well, now we have a crunch and we have to get this done in 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is. You're doing it right from the start. You're saving money. It's efficient. And you also lengthen the time that you have to keep that content in, in deployment, out in you know whatever your staff is doing with it. You don't have to come back and deal with it later. Like if I was a store, like you know this, this large retail chain, and um, you know, I, I had an ADA Title III lawsuit, I'm saying, well, how quickly can we turn this around? And we're scrambling and it's panic there. And you're like, oh man, how do we, you know, how do we do all these things? If you start from the beginning, you don't have that problem. If you launch with a site that's 
accessible from the start. You never have that panic. You never, you know, have that negative headline. Um, and so just from a, a business case, bad headline to have. From a from a human case, bad place to put your workers. Um, and so when you talk about how do we start, we're talking about universal design. And there's really like multiple approaches to how you handle the need for accessibility. One is accommodation, and that tends to be where most people go. And that's what we talked about before, where, well, I don't have a person that does this, but if someone comes in and needs it, then maybe we'll adjust. Maybe we'll create something for them. Uh, accommodation just says a person needs something and they have to ask for it. Now, I said earlier, one in eight adults are diagnosed with a disability. There might be another one in eight that don't even know they have a disability and don't even know they need to ask for an accommodation and can't complete training or can't complete a task because they don't know they need to ask. And one of the common things is, is dyslexia, actually. Most people that have dyslexia struggle with the idea that, or dyscalculia, which is uh, dyslexia is for uh, letters and dyscalculia is for numbers. Most people with those uh, disabilities don't tend to know or don't ask for help with accommodations. So in those cases, you're leaving out a large number of staff who now cannot complete their task or struggle to complete their task. But if you build content that assumes someone with dyslexia, which is the most common type of learning disability, if you assume someone with dyslexia is taking this content, let's prepare it in such a way that that person doesn't have to struggle through it or ask for help to complete it. They can just get it done and move on they don't feel stigmatized, and they don't feel segregated by having to ask. And that process is called universal design. And that says, you know you need it, do it from the start. Don't waste any resources, don't waste any time. Just do the thing from the start the way that you should. And so that process relies heavily on that web content accessibility guideline that we talked about, and you put all of that into practice as either frameworks, templates, processes, whatever that is, as you're building, and you create content with, you know, closed captions, with uh, alt text, appropriate colors, fonts, all those kinds of things, you bake that in right from the start, and you don't wait. You don't wait for someone to ask. You know, a big thing right now is bilingual content. So maybe we need an option for Spanish. You do, by the way. Maybe we need <laughs> an option for um, you know, to, to change from, you know, day mode to night mode in our content. You probably do because someone with low vision might see better using a dark background with light text on it. You know, you have to think about all those things and they, they have to be built into your processes. And the nice thing about these is that they don't really change. So you can build a template and then you can just use that template over and over and over again in all of your projects. That's universal design. Don't recreate the wheel every time, make it right once and keep doing it. I love that. So baking it into those design standards up front and having that standardized across your organization is a really helpful way to streamline that and, and be more efficient. What tips then would you offer organizations who already have a robust online catalog of courses and curriculum that they that is not accessible yet, but they want to start being more accessible? Um, so what's the best place to start because that can be pretty daunting. At several organizations that I've been at, including where I'm currently, we we have thousands and thousands of courses, and we're looking at like, well, how how do you get all this done? It's a very common problem. It's a very common question. There are really five places to start. Right, you're not going to get the entire web content accessibility guideline done in one go. You need to convince your organization it's important to do, and you need to then also get the buy-in to do all of that work. You can start with five things. You can make sure that your fonts are accessible. And that gets tricky and a, a little complicated, but basically a sans serif font is better with the exception of dyslexia. Then you want a serif font because the extra complexity makes it harder to transpose the characters. Also, if you have someone who's from a background that doesn't use the Romanized alphabet, it's easier to use Comic Sans. The bane of all designers, Comic Sans, actually has a use. <laughs> poor Comic Sans. <laughs> so, yeah. poor, poor Comic Sans, but it's good here. It's good because it mirrors what it's like to handwrite the letters. And so it makes it easier for someone from a background that doesn't come from that sort of westernized alphabet to understand 
the connection between those characters that they're seeing on the screen and what they're learning to write. Those font choices, there's not a hard and, and fast rule for those. You just have to be aware of where the audience is and customize that or build in something where the audience can choose their own font. And that makes it easy, right? Slightly more complicated, but again, build it once, build it right. Don't build it again. You have to be sure about your color contrast. There's a measurement from the background to the font color. If you have white on top of black and you measure that, it's a certain metric. And then uh, every shade of various colors in between. And so the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines says that you want 4.5 to 1 as your bare minimum. And you can measure those tools like webaim.org has a color contrast tool. Color.adobe.com has a color contrast tool. You can go find those things and you can use them to check your colors. You just want to make sure that your colors are within that threshold of at least 4.5 to 1 for that ratio of color contrast. Uh, the other thing that you want to do is make sure you have colorblind safe palettes. And this one gets tricky because we all know everyone has their branding colors and they love their branding colors. But their branding colors may not be colorblind safe. If you find that to be true in those same places that I, I talked about earlier, the web aim and uh, color.adobe.com, uh, those free tools also do colorblind safe palette checking. Again, you add your colors and you check if they meet requirements. And if not, it gives you some suggestions, like use this color instead. So if you have one, like, if you had a very specific blue that's part of your branding, and then there's like other colors involved, like uh, I always think about like blue and purple like, do not go well together from a colorblind safe uh, perspective. So if your colors are like blue and purple, you may want to use the blue exclusively or the purple exclusively, right? And then just use another color in there. Like maybe it's white, or if your blue is really light, maybe use like a darker color with, you know, that blue, something like that. You want to make sure that you have closed captions on every video everywhere. All audio should have transcripts or closed captions or something like that. Um, and then you also just want to make sure you have alt text on every image. And the reason for that is if you have a screen reader, alt text is what tells you what the picture is, is doing on the page, right? So whether that, and I say picture sort of in quotes, but it might be a button and that button's treated as an image. We have to provide alt text to say, this is a button that does this thing. It might be just a decorative image of a pretty sunset. Well, we have to provide that context. Now I will note that when it comes to writing alt text, a lot of people, for whatever reason, have liked to use PowerPoint's alt text generator. I think because it does it for you. The problem is it's, it's really bad at doing it. So like if you have a picture of a flat tire, PowerPoint will see it's a car. They'll be like, it's a car. <laughs> well, the problem is that it lost the context of the flat tire, and that's what, you're, that's what you're talking about. So when you write alt text, it has to focus on the context of whatever that image is. And so you might use a generator to get you close, but you still have to write it yourself. And so if you do those things, at the end, you'll have a project that starts to address all of the accessibility needs. Now, again, it's a long process. There's a lot more that goes into this than those five things, but you'll at least be down the road on this accessibility thing and that much closer. And so if you do those five things and then you grab five more things after that, now you've doubled what you've done in a pretty short amount of time and you just keep working in that way. And every time, you know, if you're following the Addy model or, you know, if you, even if you're doing uh, software development lifecycle modeling, when you come back to that point where you reassess that content, if you just add all the stuff that you've started to do since the last time you touched that content, you'll eventually start to build catalogs of content that have taken giant leaps over where they were before. But you have to start that process and you have to eventually, you know, put those things into place. You can make those giant leaps. It's a couple of small steps, but in a couple of years, if you do five things a year, in a couple of years, you'll have these giant leaps over where you were before. And, you know, you won't, hopefully you don't lose the perspective over that time that you can look back and say, wow, we made these huge steps in accessibility. This is awesome. And unfortunately, right now, uh, so many people are, are so um, afraid. Yeah, I, yeah, afraid. <laughs> I think so many. So, yeah, that, that's exactly it. So many people are so afraid of uh, tackling accessibility that 
the bar is so low. Like all you have to do are the five things I've mentioned and people are going to go, wow, you're awesome at accessibility. And, you know, it, it's very easy to be impressive and, and to champion accessibility in these ways because it, it is very difficult to start. And, and to your point, you know, when, when you take these things on, the reason I say those five things is because there are like the keyboard shortcuts are massively important to accessibility, but they're really complicated to implement and you need an expert to do it. And the reason I never suggest you start there is that if you start there, that becomes a barrier to you entering. Like we talk about accessibility into content. I'm talking about accessibility into accessibility, right? Like it's wildly meant and sort of silly. But if if you start with something very technical and you can't get it done, you're never going to launch the project. You'll never like it'll just never go anywhere. You're just gonna spin your wheels and be stuck. While keyboard shortcuts are massively important, they're not an easy win. And so you want these easy wins early. So that's why I start with these five. Keyboard shortcuts can be in your next group. But, um, you know, when, when you make these changes, they have to be small enough that you don't scare everyone off. Because if you scare everyone, and, and when you're talking about breaking things, right? So when you change something for one person, you don't necessarily know what's going to break for them and what that means for their job, for their, you know, their bonuses all the things they care about, whether or not they can spend time with their kids later because now they have way more work. Like, you don't know what that does for them. So you can't take these massive sweeping changes and say, by July 1, we're all going to follow this this entire web content accessibility guideline document. Like, we're going to do it like the whole way through. It won't work and it'll fall flat. So you, you have to take these small steps and you have to alleviate the fear of like accessibility being this big, scary monster that, you know, is really weird and you know frightens everyone it's not that bad you can you can start slow and walk into it it's okay right no this is great you're you're really breaking down the barriers and i think you know better for our listeners to start small than not start at all agreed yep Uh, that that's the key just start somewhere even those five things if if you only think you can do two at your organization just do two just get started if if all you can do is fonts and colors to fonts and colors. Just get started. It's okay. Starting is way better than not. Sean, I'm curious, you had mentioned some tools to measure your ratio for color contrast. Are there any other tools that you would recommend to our listeners um, for them to use for testing or anything like that as they walk through these five steps that you've outlined? Human testing is always your best bet. Um, there are automated tools. I'll talk about them in a minute, but um, human tools are, are always. Uh, like way better in terms of testing, um, especially if you can get um, people who use those accessibility tools on a regular basis. There are, are workflows and, and usability paths that you probably won't even think of when you're testing that someone who uses the tool day in, day out, that they would understand and, and they would know and they would be able to provide that feedback for you. And I know that's a, a, a resource that not everyone has. There are automated tools. Uh, one is called Wave. Wave has a cost associated with it, but it is pretty good. PayPal has a tool called the Automated Accessibility Testing Tool. That lives in a Git repository, so you have to have some programming knowledge to run and install that tool. There's also SortSight, which a lot of federal agencies use for their testing, like NASA uses it. And that also has a cost associated with it. So. They're really awesome tools, but they cost money. And again, that's where the conversation sort of can die, depending on how much your organization's plugged into it. But they're all worth the cost. Even if you have to learn a Git repository to get the tool, it's still worth the, the cost and worth doing. Those are some tools. There, there are other tools that you may be able to find. Those are the more reputable of the group and, and are more fully featured. Thank you. That was, that's really helpful. It's just, it's nice to, to know some places, some resources you can leverage, um, when you, when you dive in. And we'll, we'll put those in the show notes of this podcast too, so that people can find them very easily. Sean, thank you so much. I think this was just a, a great conversation about kind of shifting people's perceptions about accessibility. And I, I think uh, once people start doing it, it will become habit forming and it will become easy and just part and parcel of, of everything they do. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And uh, on that last note, absolutely. Once you get started, it becomes very easy to make it part of your workflow and it's not scary at all. It's just 
part of the day and fun. We can attest to that at DaVinci. So we've we've worked on a lot of uh, universal design templates with our clients and it really does get easier. So don't be scared to get started, everybody. <laughs> Good advice, Angelina and Sean. Thank you both. Angelina, it was great to hear Sean break down some of the misconceptions about accessibility. I'm sure our listeners are glad to know it's not an all or nothing proposition. It's not. And I'm, I'm so glad he, he broke everything down so easily, too. You know, and it's important to remember, you know, making your online curriculum accessible doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey. Um, and just taking that first step and tackling one element, like Sean mentioned, or creating that universal design template, that means your content's going to be more inclusive and available to all your learners, at least more than it was yesterday, even if it's not perfect yet. I know at DaVinci, you know, it took us some time and a lot of research from our designers and developers to get to a point that meeting those web content accessibility guidelines wasn't just an extra component to a project. It was part of the foundation and now it's a standard right across the board. And I think that's so important that that you know, both of you said that, that it's it's something to think about at the beginning of the project, not at the end of the project. And when you bake it in from the get go, it's just part and parcel of how we do what we do. Exactly. Well, thanks, Angeline. And special thanks to our guest, Sean Wonder, for joining us today. If you have any questions about what we talked about or have an idea for a topic or a guest, please drop us a note at poweredbylearning at davinci.com.